Vagos, Mongols, and Outlaws. My Infiltration of America's Deadliest Biker Gangs. Chapter 1, Getting Inside. July 23, 2004, Monsanto Road, Apple Valley, California. Police found the man's body spread eagle face down in bloody gravel. He looked grizzled. Early 40s, a tweaker, the Daily Press later identified as James Gavin, a.k.a. Little Jimmy, a man gunned down in the wrong place at the wrong time. One surviving victim, a woman with a lazy eye and skinny shadows, recounted how two strange men opened fire in her living room. One bullet pierced Little Jimmy's back and penetrated his heart as he fled into the street. Blood spurted from the hole in her own arm and formed dark mosaics in the tile. Everything happened like a flash film, according to the woman. Quick, hot bursts on a white screen. Sounds amplified, loud bangs, muffled screams. The front door slammed shut like a cough in deep summer. The intended victim had curiously left minutes before the intruder stormed the house. He said he felt spooked and set up for a drug rip. No one guessed the gangland murder had the Vogel signature. No one knew anything about the killer. No one except me, and technically, I didn't exist. Eight months earlier, November 2003, Victor Valley Chapter, San Bernardino County, California, with its thinly populated deserts and high mountains, was home to the Vagos Motorcycle Club, an outlaw biker gang composed mostly of ex-military personnel known as Violent Predators and dubbed the largest urban terrorist organization in the United States by San Bernardino County DA Michael A. Ramos. Intelligence sounds warned that the Vagos, known as the Green Nation, posed an extreme threat to law enforcement. Members had purportedly infiltrated public safety agencies operating as moles, securing sworn, non-sworn positions, and working undercover to obstruct and dismantle police investigations. Can you get inside? Detective Samantha Kyles of the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department, SBSD, challenged me one chilly morning before Thanksgiving 2003. She sat across from me in a room in the department's criminal intelligence division and warmed her hands on her coffee mug. A petite blonde with an affiable smile, Kyle's disarmed. Trim and fit, she looked every bit a marathon runner. Fiercely determined, she watched me with the steady gaze of a predator sizing up her prey. At six foot three, I towered over Kyle's, even seated. I had no experience with the biker subculture, had never ridden on or owned a Harley. Moreover, I didn't look like a biker. When I smuggled narcotics for the Bulgarian mob, I blended in as a businessman, clean cut, sharply dressed, no tattoos. But I faced a minimum sentence of 22 years in prison for conspiracy to distribute and manufacture 100 pounds of methamphetamine, so it was my best interest to cooperate. And I had already been betrayed by my so-called loyal minions. You grew up here, Kyle's took a sip? True and I had already proved my reliability as a confidential informant, CI, for the U.S. Customs and Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA. Newly released from pretrial house arrest, I now had mobility to work more complex cases, not just drug deals or cartel, but gangs. I had voiced as much to my handler at the DEA, and he had connected me to Kyle's. I know skinheads, I said, and named gangs where I could easily blend in as a Caucasian male. But more than any other group, Kyle's advised the Vagos terrorize Southern California. My poverty-stricken childhood as a white sore in a Hispanic barrio flashed in my mind's eye. Freedom had one exit and I took it. I became a drug dealer, my life consumed by smuggling large quantities of cocaine from South America to Europe. Money motivated me and I had talent. At the time, I justified my activities with my own felonious code of ethics. At least I wasn't a snitch or a child rapist. And as the drug market evolved from cocaine to methamphetamine, I became a cook, earning a half million dollars a year. As I shuffled from room to room in my spacious mansion with its white walls and fancy leather furniture, I struggled to save the illusion even as my addiction ravaged me. Money blew around me, smacked into the ceiling fans, fluttered in the street like confetti. My expensive cars disappeared, repossessed. My wife left. Sweat drenched me. I paced the halls, slammed each door shut, worried that the shadow people might find me. Without electricity, my house became an inferno. Foil covered my windows, blocking the sunlight. 
My life continued without definition, hour after hour of endless monotony. I closed my eyes and hoped no one saw me, pounding at my front door, loud, crib shouts, police, open up. I raced to the nearest bathroom. On my knees, hands shaking, I flushed drugs down the toilet. Water splashed on my cheeks, my head clouded with noise. Black clad bodies crashed through my bathroom door. Their raid jackets announcing in bold, white letters, Los Angeles County Sheriff's SWAT Team. MP5 machine guns targeted my chest and razor lead beams framed my heart, yet I felt sudden relief. Other federal agencies had launched several unsuccessful investigations into the Vagos. Four or five times the size of the Hells Angels in Southern California, the gang's violence was legion, and law enforcement had become increasingly alarmed as the Vagos' penchant for brutal and unprovoked assaults, firearms trafficking, distribution and sales of dangerous narcotics, extortion, loan sharking, and murder spread the biker scene into the general population. Like rats, the gang members lived deep in the city sewers, foul and deadly. But the government had no interest in pest control. They needed extermination. What do I have to do? I folded my arms across my chest, pumped for the assignment. Kyle's briefed me on the Vagos' history and growth. The club formed in the 1960s in San Bernardino City and spawned 24 chapters in Southern California, Arizona, Hawaii, Nevada, Oregon, and Utah, with 10 chapters in Mexico, Baja California, Jalisco, Mexico City. The gang, originally called the Cycles, chose as its insignia Loki, the Norse of God mischief, riding a motorcycle. The gang had no official enemy, no incentive to declare war on rivals like the Hells Angels or Mongols. So-called fence riders, their power derived from their unpredictability and terror campaigns. The club subscribed to the philosophy that it was better to be feared than revered. They were mafia on the wheel. They were the mafia on wheels. But on They were the mafia on wheels but without the pretense of respectability or legitimacy. The Vagos never hid their brutality, they flaunted it. And whether their bravado derived from sheer machoism, raw animal instinct, or jockeying for position in the drug economy, their acts left a staggering body count. Get inside, gather intelligence on the gang, identify the club's leaders, purchase drugs from them, and collect as many illegal firearms as you can, Kyle said and recited a list of bars the Vagos frequented within a 40 mile radius of my apartment. Members would not be difficult to spot, she continued. Outlaw biker gangs proudly flew their cuts. Denim or leather, sleeveless vests adorned with coated patches that signified a member's criminal and sexual achievements. They wanted the public to know they were outlaws. So-called one percenters who represented a minority of motorcycle enthusiasts responsible for committing 99% of all crime. Look for officers. Kyle's drained her coffee. But when I said I had no clue what officers were, she simplified the green patch. Full patch members wore a bottom rocker that announced California and a top arc that displayed Vagos. The triangular center patch reinforced the V of Vagos and depicted Loki. The name Vagos, though sounded vaguely Hispanic, actually stemmed from the word vagabond moving around and its membership was 70% white. The leadership, however, was Hispanic. After that, you have to improvise. My pay for my risk was time, not money. If I didn't want to spend the rest of my life behind bars, I would have to produce results. 22 years tightened like a noose around my neck. I had no plan, no bike, and no government protection. I had never felt more alone. At first, I took Kyle's lead and hung out at armpits like the mother load hoping to eavesdrop on conversations with bikers as I shot pool and drank beer with patrons. The Vagos' drinking cheer, Viva Los Vagos, and Butt Fuck the Rest, thundered through the place. Gra graffiti on the walls was a strange combination of reality and fantasy, from Grand Theft Auto Gaming, a fictional Hispanic street gang in Los Angeles at war with the fictional Grove Street Gang. I watched members slam back shots. Stress coursed through me like an electric current. I lived in a dingy apartment 30 miles from the county line with my pit bull, Hercules. Each night, I drove in the chilly darkness from my home to a bar, then back home, often stumbling in after three in the morning, dehydrated, hungry, sleep deprived, 
and anxious about beginning the new charade hours later. After two weeks of nothing, I formulated a plan. The mother load, situated in Hesperia, smelled, rank, a mixture of beer, piss, and puke. Harleys lined the perimeter. Music pulsed like a frantic heartbeat, dimly lit, hazy from cigarette smoke, cramped with pool tables, a jukebox, and green tinted walls in honor of the Vagos, the place buzzed with an undercurrent of violence. Several full patch Vagos huddled together, beers in hand. The bartender, a rough looking troll of a woman, slid a cold butt across the counter towards me with hands that resembled slabs of meat. Green fluorescent lights flickered above the bar, paraphernalia advertising Vagos parties, he called them runs, littered one corner. Conversation punctuated the noise like grunts. My attention focused on an attractive brunette draped around a worn denim clad biker who looked like something recovered from the trash. Dressed in black jeans, shirtless, with tattoos covering every inch of his arms and a green swat stick of tattoo across his protruding belly. A grizzly handling bar mustache framed his mouth. A green bandana covered his tightly cropped hair. The number 22 was displayed prominently on his left forearm for the 22nd